record, record the meeting and kick things off. I want to thank everybody for joining. And it, uh, you know, and it's just because it, it's it's still a hectic time. You know, we thought uh, May was hectic with the home and garden show. And of course, now we're hurtling through June, right, coming into the garden tour, right? So, you know, life never stops here. Um, I'm going to have time later on, um, uh, Rhonda and Terry, to talk about the um, uh, the tour. Are there any opening comments you guys want to make just right now from the get-go? I just want to thank our volunteers. We already have 54 of our members who have signed up to help with the garden tour. Plus, we have um, a few more of past, past uh, members that have uh, retired from our group, but they're helping with our tour. Most nice. excellent. Yeah. Yep. Congratulations, to everybody. Yeah. Yeah, it's very good news. We have at least six um, volunteers in each garden over the two shifts. Nice. That really smells good. That's for sure. So we'll talk more about that as we get into it. You know, I want to welcome everybody here to our meeting here today. Um, we're going to go through our normal program of announcements and activities here. Um, Bob Case will be joining us here. Uh, shortly to talk about the Lewis and Clark expedition and the botanical findings of that uh, of that. So um, uh, he's got a he's got like 300 slides here that we're going to we're going to fly through. And it, uh, I want to encourage questions and activities right that play into all this. Um, uh, but it, uh, his, it's going to be it's going to be quite a presentation and quite a quite a learning opportunity here. So to kick off, it's a big birthday month you know, as Aaron knows and Rhonda knows, and I'm presuming that you've had it, uh, you know, a great birthday, Aaron, you know, that the, and Rhonda is, as well, you know, as the people have done well, or I guess, I guess Rhonda, you're still coming up on yours, right? But happy birthday to everybody. John, of course, Tammy, Mary Jean, Pam, and Mike Carvey is gonna close out the month here, you know, with a birthday. So happy birthday all, a busy July month. Okay, as we jump in, um, you know, to the uh, to the websites and so forth, I just want to make I want to keep everybody up to up to date in terms of there's been a lot of um, uh, changes and updates and new things happening with the websites. Um, you'll find out, you know, this is the um, uh, under the state site, mastergardener.wsu.edu. You can drill down to the new state site uh, foundation uh, websites, and there's some great explanations here in terms of the differences between the program and the foundation. Uh, that are on the site there. I also want to recognize as we get into the foundation itself, right, is that at our board meeting last month, we actually had a volunteer willing to step up to the president-elect position. You recall that for some months, right, we've been, you know, we've been positioning, you know, at, uh, uh, that we'd had, we had an open slot here for the president-elect role. Elizabeth has, has very willingly, uh, you know, it, uh, acceded to uh, uh, be selected for this role. And so she is now our president elect. We will formally elect officers come October, but at least at this juncture, we have a full slate of um, of officers uh, for the uh, for the organization. Okay, and so again, that's a reminder that one of the things that Elizabeth's going to be doing early on this summer is putting together a nominating committee for officers for 2024. All of our officers for the foundation, all of our officers for the foundation, run on one year terms. And remember, the foundation, distinct from the program, runs a nonprofit corporation, which is which we are, the Master Gardener Foundation of Grays Harbor and Pacific Counties. And so per Washington state law and per the IRS precepts as a nonprofit, we are, you know, we operate with corporate officers. And at, uh, these officers then are elected at our October meeting per our bylaws. And at, um, I'm welcoming Elizabeth to the meeting right now. And it, um, I will ask her when she joins here, Elizabeth, if you have any opening comments and perspectives you want to share with us. Are you talking to me, Kelly? I'm talking to you, Elizabeth. <laughs> yes, for sure. I just you jumped on. I just want to say that um, I'm kind of excited about doing the president. You notice the word kind of excited about doing the president-elect thing. I'm really pleased that I'm going to be able to work with Sabine, who has so much board experience and, and time with other organizations, and with you, Kelly, who have been both the president, the vice president, and virtually every other thing on the board. 
I've got Sharon to call on as um, a past president, as well as Barbara Peters. So um, as I learn and grow in, in the, the president-elect position, I'm kind of excited, but I'll only do the president for one year. So I want everyone to know that one year. Elizabeth, I made comment just before you go on. There's a part of your role right now is actually building a nominating committee, right? For roles oh, absolutely. for 24. Working on it. Okay. Yep. So again, one of the things that Elizabeth's hitting on, and I want to emphasize, is that the burdens of being an officer of the corporation are not that are not you know they're not overwhelming. Um, although, with uh, with due respect to Terry and Rhonda and uh, and uh, Robin, with respect to organizing all the major events we have, I don't want to minimize their effort. But I certainly want to uh, make sure that folks know that uh, that you know there's a lot of work we can be doing here, to, uh, all of us, to help. Um, to help in this, uh, you know, help in this activity. And I'm certainly hoping that everybody will be prepared to step up for 2024. Okay, reminder again that um, the three geographic subgroups we have in the foundation, they will elect their own directors, right, for 2024. Jan represents Pacific County, Val represents Greater Grays Harbor, and so Sheila represents Coastal Grays Harbor. And again, um, you know, at, um, at, at, uh, in October um, or in the fall, um, you all are, you know, given a thumbs up to select, um, you know, the local ordinance. These individuals have um, the voting, they're, they're, they're directors at the corporate level. So they have a voting uh, membership at the board level. Very important roles. Tony, of course, is our faculty liaison and Alina and Brenda are our coordinators. Uh, we know from uh, uh, Tony that uh, we are one of, two counties in the state of Washington that support our overall coordinators. Um, every other county in the state has full WSU support in having their coordinators funded by WSU. We, part of the, and part of the fundraising activities we go through, of course, are actually funding ourselves because we have to have the coordinators and we have to have a liaison, a faculty liaison. I'll make note also that from a Tony's perspective, she gets no credit from WSU for performing as our faculty liaison. She's actually doing this as kind of extra credit on her own regard. So at, again, we're a scrappy organization here operating, um, you know, operating fairly independently and uh, self-sufficiently. You can appreciate that. Okay. Reminder here of our member meetings here is that uh, we're here, uh, you know, our, our calendar for 2023, we made a decision here that the first two months of each quarter, we'll have a Zoom meeting on Tuesday morning. The third month of the quarter, we'll have a face, we hope we'll have a, a Zoom meeting on the, on the, at, uh, on the Saturday, also at 10 o'clock. Um, I think one of the things we'll be talking about, you know, at the board level, we had a great potluck last June, sat at the June Saturday meeting. Um, maybe we want to continue that to have a face-to-face -face meeting and a potluck. The, at, um, the Montesano Library was a great um, uh, location for that, and this this maybe this is something we want to keep going as we move into the new um, the new um, the new year. Um, I'm trying to keep the same Zoom URL month to month, although I did have to change it this past month for whatever reason I don't know. But uh, you know, it's every time sometimes Zoom doesn't update and just fouls up yeah. um, some of the uh, some of the best laid plans of mice and men here. Uh, but um, you know, we'll try to keep this uh, PNWMG dash Foundation URL for the regular meetings. And then again, going on to uh, the board meetings, our board meetings will always be on the second Tuesday, the second Tuesday of every month at 6 p.m. 6 p.m. to allow full membership, full participation from uh, lots of folks here. Okay, and we'll, we'll keep that uh, that URL for that Zoom. We'll keep going. Okay, coming on to July uh, to dos here. We're looking here at um, uh, the OSU July uh, to do list. Um, it's interesting. We're already starting to think about fall plantings when indeed we're just now getting going with our July and June harvest. So at, um, there's a lot of things that are uh, happening in the gardens here, and it. Um, and it, uh, I, I hope all of you are at the same position we're finding ourselves in, having overplanted with all of our lettuces and greens, right? And it, uh, you know, and finding, you know, and this is soon be the time which we'll have to figure out where we're going to find homes for all the zucchini that uh, we've grown. 
other to do's this is the best this is the the a key thing i keep forgetting here is the best time to water is early in the morning and we're watering deeply into the soil not the foliage um in fact we had a plant clinic in Owaco just this last saturday it was interesting in terms of some of the questions that were coming up from individuals who clearly had bad watering habits and that was contributing to ill health of their gardens so again per osu water in the morning water deeply into the soil um hanging baskets obviously this time of year especially as 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 these more as these marine layers burn off you know and the afternoon becomes scorching we're finding our hanging baskets you know, really need a lot of attention reminder about lawn clippings and this is especially important for the lot of, for a lot of the uh, a lot of the public individuals which we're dealing with is that do not compost those clippings right if you're treating that lawn with um, herbicide or special fertilizers, weed and feed. And of course, that uh, composting diseased plants is also a no-no unless you've really got a hot compost pile moving on. July to-dos, all kinds of stuff here with respect to tomatoes, trees, blueberries, um, roadies, cutworm damage. So this, it's, a, it's a time to be active in the garden on so many fronts. Um, any particular a question I want to raise to the group here, any particular pest this year that are presenting themselves that are of a surprising annoyance, something we want to make sure that we're alerting the public to in our outreach with them? Uh, mites, aphids, spittle bugs, any, anything new or particularly troubling in your gardens that we want to make note of now? Kelly, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. In the, in the Alma Demo Garden, Cindy and, and, and most of us have seen the appearance of the cucumber beetle and they're all over our squash plants. And the, they lay their eggs near the roots so the larvae, larvae go down and eat the roots. And I'm not sure if it's the larvae or the adult that spreads a virus that can totally wipe out cucumbers and squashes and so it, it, they're just it, if you happen to be in the demo garden take a look at them and cindy can show you where they are but they're pretty amazing and they're teeny weeny things and they fly so i asked the question if crop rotation would help we don't know because cindy just planted the the uh, new raised beds up by the gazebo with squash so we hope they're not going to fly that far are you treating them with anything washing them out or no oh. okay any other pest any other particular problems we want to make sure that we're all aware of okay so again there's a lot of stuff to be paying attention to under uh, uh, under August of July and uh, you know July to do's we're talking about a lot of the root vegetables here you know rhubarb asparagus um, you know it's interesting the mulching here to conserve soil moisture and the staking of course for wind and for tall uh, for tall flowering plants you know there's a, so much to be paying attention to here as we get into the uh, as we get into the uh, the heat of the summer okay I wanted to open this up opportunity now for just. Um, updates and announcements i wanted to uh, you know just particularly move quickly right to talk about the garden tour coming up you know in just a couple weeks um i've got this slide here uh terry and then another slide talking about the plant sale but at, uh, i want to turn it over to both you um rhonda you've got your hand up and at uh, terry to talk to us about the garden tour coming up so soon first Go, you want to go first, Rhonda? No, you go right ahead. Uh, I just want to say that that uh, we have uh, many members who have signed up, but if you if you uh, still think you have time to do it, we we have room for you. Um, we have kind of the the bare minimum that we'd like to have for a garden tour, so that's wonderful. Um, We've tried to schedule so that um, you work well, with the exception of a handful, <laughs> mainly garden reps and Kelly and Bev, um, 
that you work one shift so you can get out and see the other gardens. Um, and you get a, a ticket, a free ticket uh, to do that. So thank you very much. And uh, I think it's gonna be a wonderful tour. The gardens look great. And th there's a nice variety of styles of gardens. So uh, I think people are gonna enjoy the tour very much. And Terry, you clarified for me uh, uh, that we can still buy tickets at the day of the tour at Amy's um, house at the at the plant sale opportunity. Yeah, yeah. Any any at any of the gardens actually. Okay. Um, it, all the gardens will have some extra tickets, but the easiest place to get a ticket um, where you don't have to know an address for a garden is at the plant sale, and we don't advertise the actual addresses of the of the tour gardens but the plant sale of course uh we can we can uh, give out also because um we sell tickets uh in elma at dennis company that's another easy place if you need to buy a ticket the day of the tour any particular questions regarding the tour per se for terry again it's 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 certainly coming up countdown okay so what i'm going to add to this is today there will be an email going out to all members regarding delivery of plants that you've been growing that need to be at the elma site and in the email it will give you the days and the times that Amy and I have worked out that we can have somebody there to take delivery of your plants and hopefully it meets what uh, members can travel to Elma to do. Um, I just want to kind of state for those that are here, please remember that um, when you wait and bring everything on Saturday morning, it's kind of chaotic for us. So if there's ways that we can get the plants to Amy's garden before Saturday morning, will really, I will really appreciate it, but you can always contact me. And again, the email will be going out today. Thank you. I do trust that folks, you know, here in the call and across, you know, the Master Gardener community are indeed, you know, uh, continuing to grow, to make divisions, to, uh, you know, have these plants available. You know, it's a big deal. I think as we've talked before, people really want to buy from Master Gardeners. They do trust our product. They yeah. trust the materials we're producing. Um, and we know we can deliver, you know, some quality product here. Mm -hmm. And Rhonda, I think it goes without saying is that please label everything. Yes, please. I'll be there with a pen and a marker, but um, sometimes we get things that we, we just don't know what they are. So if you don't know what it is, hey, tell me that too. Save me the work and energy of, of trying to look things up and um, mark them unknown and we'll go from there. And if you can get down to the specific subspecies or cultivar, please do so. Because uh, so many of the plants we have now, you know, I have hybridized and have yeah. a particular, uh, have a particular uh, uh, var varietal that we'd like to identify with. We also have a lot of um, perennials that get sold. And the biggest question is we may know the perennial, but we don't know what the color of the flowers are. And people are really interested in that. I don't think many of you would buy things flowering if you didn't know the color. So, you know, add that to your list so that we know. It's gonna be a great day. I'm thankful for all the help and the amount of work that Terry has put into this is truly astounding. She's got a love for this that I don't know that anybody will ever replace her. <laughs> That's all I have. Watch for the email. Other questions from any of us here regarding July 22nd, a very key date. By the way, it's very exciting, Terry, as you opened up with here, is that we have such a large group of our community that is volunteering and participating yeah. because it, it clearly shows the engagement, right, you know, of all of us, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of making this thing happen. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Reminder. That we are indeed, this is, I still think we're still in um, the early, are we in, oh no, I guess we're not, we we passed the early bird time. Um, can I have we? one more thing? Oh, please, Terry, yeah. What I failed to mention is that our own um, Elma demonstration garden is an official tour garden this year. 
And it's really worth taking a look at if you haven't been there recently. Uh, there is so much new to look at. The new gazebo is up and it's gorgeous. New raised beds that are already planted. Um, there's very, very exciting um, new things happening in the demo garden. And uh, it belongs to all of us. So it behooves all of us to, to check it out. You know, a quick shout out on that regard, because um, Bev and I had a chance to visit. Um, and again, a, a shout out to Val to your raised beds that really look outstanding in terms of how you've laid those out. And this mm -hmm. gazebo, you know, again, echoing what Terry is saying, this gazebo here offers shelter for, uh, you know, for all kinds of group meetings we'll be able to have there at the demo garden. We recognize that that demo garden there in Elko, that's kind of our retail front front store, right? It's our, you know, it's, it's where thousands of people over the course of a year see us. And it, it's an incredibly meaningful and valuable, um, uh, valuable location for sharing. So kudos for the tremendous amount of work that's going on to maintain that garden. And so it's going to be pretty exciting having that garden featured on July 22nd. Yep. Val, in particular, yeah. is there any, any comments, any reach out for volunteer oh, support you want to make it happen ahead of time, just at, um, you know, with respect to the garden there? Just what you said, I think it's spectacular that that new area is just amazing. Um, it's simple and it's beautiful. And the last touch, and I think that we agreed that we won't see grass in that area until after, uh, of course, the, the uh, garden tour and the fair, and we're having our first GGH meeting, that, or our August GGH meeting at the gazebo. So we, we won't plant that area with Eagle Lawn until all the trampling is done. So. Yeah, other than that, it, everything looks spectacular. Cindy and Jude and Rick and all of us who go to the demo garden regularly have really put forth an effort to present an absolutely stunning scene for everybody. So if you haven't been there for a while, come and visit. Karen, you have your hand up. Sharon or Aaron? Sh Sharon, you have your hand up, yes. Yeah. Um, are we using any of the material from horses or other critters like Zudu uh, that they don't use in the arena for the demo garden? Yes. Cindy uses it for the pathways, and we filled a lot of the new beds, which are 28 inches tall. We use that extensively. And we were so fortunate. I was digging into it and found a really hot spot that even had mycorrhizal uh, fungi just doing well. Unfortunately, <laughs> the zoo, the uh, maintenance team had to haul that away to empty the bin for the upcoming fair. So it's gone because I wanted to do my own raised beds. Oh. With but yes, we're using that extensively for material. We can't go wrong with it. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I wanted to shift gears and make sure we're talking. We're looking forward here to the uh, the state conference. The state conference coming at the end of September. <laughs> and as I've noted, we've we've passed the at, um, you know the early bird uh, session on this, uh, but it looks to be a very rich set of classes coming in here. And so at, um, any comments, Aaron, Karen, or Sharon regarding the state conference coming up? I know we need to be thinking about um, raffle items and um, another, another materials. Raffle got, for sure, yes. Uh -huh. We have a couple. Well, yes, and, and uh, Rhonda has one that she emailed me about. Um, it has to do with uh, displaying art. Right, Rhonda? Um, it is a artist. I don't know how to describe it. You'll have to see it. It, uh, it was designed in Aberdeen by an artist, and um, the business is run out of Aberdeen. It's an easel that's designed on a really unique mounting system that artists can use it to hold everything from clay to wood 
to if you're doing uh, paintings or drawings, and it's the way that this easel mounts on things that makes it incredibly unique. I think that artists will know what it is and how to use it. The general population may not, but it's pretty cool. I, I bought it at an auction and it didn't work for what I wanted it for. It's about $150. And so I'm donating it brand new in the box. And I think set up at the conference, it'll be a pretty cool item for for artists anyway. So, so Karen, Aaron, and Sharon, tell us what kind of items are you looking for for the raffle items here? How how big, how large, obviously easily transportable? Something that's worth money so that we get lots of money for them. <laughs> lots of bids, something that people like. It could be a garden wind chime, a statuary for a garden that's small enough, not a big fountain, or it could be a, a dinner or a destination um, like Westport Winery uh, over here, or so, so gift certificates and so trip, forth as well. Uh, yeah, a bed and breakfast. Uh, I've done that. Um, you meet some interesting people from different areas. I I donated that one year. So um, things that you might not use or haven't used, purchased like Rhonda was discussing, uh, that are new new condition. You know, may have may still be in the box. Uh, you put it back in the box when you found out it didn't work. <laughs> And so um, alcohol is okay, but uh, but keep yes. your cannabis keep your cannabis gummies at home. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Any other thing regarding the state conference coming up? Again, end of um, September. It's in uh, Tacoma, so it's relatively nearby. Again, a great <laughs> opportunity to pick up your continuing education hours. Yes, um, it's right near the. LeMay Car Museum, it's the Chihuly Museum, the State Historical Museum is there at Pacific Avenue. There are some nice restaurants there on Pacific Avenue and down on the waterway in Tacoma. Um, and so if you're bringing family or a spouse or a significant other, there was plenty for them to do while you're tied up in class. Very good. Rhonda, you have your hand back up again or no? I did, but the thought went right out of my head that fast. <laughs> okay. So if I think can, of it, I'll put it we in can the add, in We the can chat. add to it here. <laughs> okay, I want to move on and talk about recording our hours. Definitely, at, um, you know, at, uh, you saw in the e-news this week a salute from Alina uh, that we're getting our, at, uh, you know, our, our, hours, uh, our hours recorded here. Alina, do you want to echo that? Brenda, you want to share anything as well? Um. This is Elena. I'm still recording the hours, you know, weekly. Um, and I'm pleased to see that, you know, every week I'm record I'm verifying about a hundred entries. So that's gratifying. Brenda found out that there's still a third of our group that have not entered any hours for this year so far. And so um, from personal experience, I can say that if you're not entering your hours every month, number one, um, you are not honoring the agreement that we have with WSU. Yeah. And number two, that it's going to be a lot harder to remember those events, those hours, the dates. And people have told me they spend like two hours recording their hours and they say, I'll never do this again. So uh, word to the wise. Any questions or comments from anyone respect to ordering the hour? Hopefully, hopefully now having done this for a couple of years, we're all well-schooled with Give Pulse and we can easily at, uh, get, these, uh, get these hours entered. Rhonda, you have your hand up? Oh, you're on mute. both for Karen and Elena, the CE hours that we obtain or earn going to the state conference, are they recorded against our current year or does that roll into next year? From what I understand and Brenda can 
correct me or add to what I'm going to say, they are, they count towards 2023 because that's when they okay. were. Okay. Uh, done. Yeah. Yeah, they'd be the current year, I would think. Yeah, very good. If you have any questions about, you know, you make a mistake, you don't know how to fix it. Um, Brenda gave some information in e news about that. If you have any questions about give posts, both Brenda and I can walk you through it. Um, I would much rather have you contact us rather than spending an hour trying to figure it out and getting frustrated. Very good. Well, thanks all. And by the way, thanks to everybody for, for getting those hours entered. And it, um, and again, it, a reminder to everybody to get those hours in, right? Because it, uh, as you know, as we noted here, it's you know we're halfway through the year, you know, halfway through the calendar year, and so we're on a calendar year with respect to recording all these hours. This is a great opportunity to take a check with yourself in terms of how we're doing relative to accruing those hours, and relative to reporting on that data. So hopefully, again, it's been it's we made it very clear to lots of opportunities for continuing education, tremendous amount of opportunities for volunteer hours, right? So let's just uh, let's keep after that. Okay, with that, I want to remind everybody of the eight uh, emphases that have been introduced this year by the Master Gardener program with respect to who we are and what we're doing here. And it um, you know it's indeed it's indeed fun having these different focuses or foci that we can share and talk about with respect to the with respect to the community here. And it um, you know it's just been a great uh, it's been a great reminder where we're going to be at here. And this actually plays to what we're going to be talking about here uh, very soon. Here at, uh, is that we're going to be introducing Bob Case from Contra Costa County, California, to talk about Lewis and Clark and the the botanical discoveries that they made during this expedition and during this incredibly important time uh, that they spent out here. And that uh, one of the things that uh, we're gonna be talking about as I uh, shift presentations and get set up for, uh, uh, for Bob is that um, I'll let him do an introduction in terms of where he's coming from on this, but it, uh, you know, the, the opportunity, you know, of learning of things that we started, that we started to think about um, that, uh, I mean, we're going back, you know, almost 220 years now with respect to, um, you know, with respect to the, um, uh, the expedition and the findings that they made all that many years ago and how significant they're going to be even for us today. So it's, a, uh, it's one of the things that, uh, we, we, we sometimes take Lewis and Clark for granted. The fact that they were here in the Pacific Northwest, that they spent a lot of time, thinking about uh, about the expert about the, their explorations but the fact their whole botanical side the whole dimension of the expedition relative to their botanical explorations and their botanical discoveries um, are incredibly significant hey with that bob i want to introduce yourself you want to do a quick bio of yourself here and that uh, and we launch into this well you got the number one slide right up on the screen there fans uh I, i've done a lot of stuff community college teacher and uh uh, agricultural commissioner deputy with Contra Costa County. So I've got a broad agricultural and a uh, botanical uh, background. I uh, got my master's degree in ecology and systematics, which is what is it and what does it do? And uh, that's basically the first questions I think any child asks as they're walking down the seashore with their kids and they see, see something on, what is that? What does it do? Or of course, and then the other ones, can I eat it? But those are some of the basic questions. And I, I had a very good mother who helped me get through that stuff. So I went through uh, uh, a lot of teaching and I taught in high school for a few days and then I uh, ended up with uh, the Department of Agriculture, and I uh, have enjoyed, after retirement, the Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation. So I retired about the same time that the uh, bicentennial was going on, and that was a big thing. So let's go to the next slide there. So the botanical legacy of the voyage of discovery. Now this is, it says the Lewis and Clark voyage of discovery, but guess what? Next slide. Thomas, it was actually some people have called it the Thomas Jefferson Voyage of Discovery. He sent Lewis, who was his secretary on this voyage, 
And he, uh, Lewis chose another person who had been his uh, sergeant when he was in the military as a, a co-person to go with him. He was the brother of uh, uh, Rogers Clark, who uh, was the, uh, let's say, the opener of the entire western part of the United States. And John Rogers Clark was a, you know, a general. And uh, so uh, Clark, who took on with, uh, you know, Meriwether Lewis and, uh, uh, and Clark, they formed a great team. So... Uh, uh, let's, uh, I don't know if you want me to, I, I'm, I'm convenient or happy with this uh, uh, arrangement that we have now with all of this people. They don't need to see me talking necessarily. Here's Monticello and, and Lewis spent three years here with, uh, with President Jefferson and he was being groomed. And Jefferson holds numerous uh, patents and all kinds of things. He's, and he actually put some of the collection into his foyer, if you've ever been to Monticello. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, the take home message, Thomas Jefferson had tried four times to get somebody to go to the West. Michaud, who was arrested as a spy. Uh, Ledyard Stebbins, who was arrested by the Russians, but he was trying to do it the other way. And uh, he even asked uh, uh, Clark's brother to do it. And they all said, no, but, when Lewis saw his secretary and saw that he had these skills, he was his neighbor and he was chosen. He knew he was educated. He was virtually, uh, you know, very well versed in the ways of the, uh, the wilderness and, uh, and, and exploring. And he was, a, he was a good soldier. So they, uh, uh, Clark was actually written to by Lewis and he signed him on as a, uh, co-captain and uh, uh, they spent three winters, one at Camp Woods in Illinois, right across the Mississippi from uh, St. Louis, Fort Mandan in North Dakota up in the cold north and at Fort Clatsop and actually preferred Fort Mandan because the Indians were friendlier and at Fort Clatsop they got rain almost every day out of 106 days they got rain 100 days so uh, it's uh, anyway. And yeah, yeah, of course, Native Bob, just, Americans... to, just to jump in on that one, of course, those of us in the Northwest, we know we know what winters are like up here, Bob. So what I appreciate that you okay. in California, you know, might be might be staggered by rain every day, you know, but it just. <laughs> we got rain. <laughs> we got rain this year. So anyway, and, and, and please, Kelly, step in any time. And please, uh, all I of us, to, by the way, I, I, you know, if indeed there are questions and seem like put them in chat or raise your hand, you know, so the Bob's got a wealth of knowledge here, you know, and he really wants to engage. Okay. And uh, they wrote over 1 million words and mostly uh, Lewis was the botanist and biologist, naturalist historian. Clark was the disciplinarian and the, uh, guide and the what can we say the uh, uh, the army person there I guess would be the best way to put it uh, 260 plants mentioned 20 220 collected it was 176 new to science plant specimens were uh, <laughs> sent me this, uh, secured this route I have wrote a whole paper on just that and uh, 60 plant specimens were lost. Lewis, the collector, Barton, Persh, and ANCS handled the collection. Barton was given the responsibility. Persh described some of the plants, and ANS handled some of them. Lewis collected a lot of these plants and wrote great descriptions, but he wasn't a biologist, a record bi uh, recognized biologist. So he didn't get credit for any of the uh, collection. Although over 60 plants have the name Louisii at the end, let's go to the next slide. And uh, many of them have, uh, uh, there are the two genera, Lewis, Louisia and Clarkia, but Lewis was the botanist. Clarkia has, Clark has only the genus named after him. No spe species are named after Clark. He only collected one plant on the whole trip. Lewis collected 260 or, or wrote about. 
Okay, so the object of your mission is to go to the headwaters of the Missouri River. This is the instructions that Jefferson gave to Lewis, and he trusted Lewis. He knew that he was an intelligent person who could look at some of the plants and know a lot about what was new and what wasn't new and what we should be uh, talking about. And of course, the bottom line here was err on the side of your safety. Bring back the party safe, even if it be with less information. So if you confront the Indians, if you confront the Grizzly, get out of there. Um, and he ended up uh, uh, only losing one person on the whole trip, and that was from appendicitis, which could have been cured by anything. In there. Let's go to the next slide. And who were these guys, Lewis and Clark? They're basically uh, very different people, but they got along together. And that's very important on a trip. You know, if you go into the moon, you want to be able to do, uh, be with people. And this was exploration of terra incognita. Nobody knew it was out there. There were some words from a few of them. But let's go to the next slide. Lewis was the botanist. He was Jefferson's neighbor and friend. He was his secretary, and he had a mother. I had a good mother, and Lewis had a mother that was an herbalist, and she taught him a lot of the plants and a lot of the lore of the plants in the area. Uh, he was trained by Jefferson. I mean, you can't get, and not only was he trained by Jefferson, Jefferson sent him to Philadelphia, which was the capital of the United States at that time, as far as thought and everything, he sent him there and he sent him to four different uh, biologists and uh, astronomers and uh, doctors who were very, very wise and who knew a heck of a lot about what was going on uh, in, in currently in sciences. And uh, we don't know how he died. There's, it's it's, it's a possibly a suicide, but most likely... Uh, I mean, most likely a suicide, but there's possibility that somebody else killed him. He had manic depressive habits. He had affinities for alcohol and opium at various times. He was the governor of the Louisiana Territory. And as Jefferson said, he was of undaunted courage. If Jefferson, if, if Lewis said it, Jefferson believed it. Okay, and Captain Clark was a U.S. Army person, guardian of his brother, an alcoholic, uh, Revolutionary War hero, a Virginian transplanted to Missouri, not highly educated. He wrote his entries into the journals are not very uh, good grammar, and he most of the time copied what Lewis had to say. But he had map making and river skills, and he actually adopted Sacagawea's children after the trip. He became the Missouri Territorial Governor and partners with others and wanted to, he lived a long, respected life, but he's, he was a pioneer in the West in as much, let's go to the next slide, in as much as he uh, started a lot of fur trading uh, exploration. So this I mentioned Lewis's mother, and I don't need to spend a heck of a lot of, about this, but she was a, a woman of uh, a perfect person having activity beyond her sex, which is very misogynistic, but it's still, she could handle a gun. She made hams better than anybody in uh, Virginia. And uh, Thomas Jefferson cherished having some of her hams. And she had a whole route. Uh, let's go to the next slide of um, clients. And she was riding horses into her 70s to visit her clients and provide care and herbal medicine. Next slide. Okay, part of the mission was to see the natives, and I don't want to discount, and I don't know if there are any uh, Native Americans in the group, but uh, the, the interaction with the, with the natives was very important. Uh, and Barton wrote a whole list of things that he wanted. They actually got the language uh, and a dictionary, uh, a vocabulary of almost all the tribes they spent any time with. They did a tremendous job collecting data. And of course, the Hidatsa and the Mandan were very helpful. The Yankton Sioux were their ones that they had problems with, both coming and going, uh, but especially going up, they actually grabbed the boats and didn't want to let them go. But 
uh, I tell you, the, uh, the I didn't mention that the Sakagawea, who was the woman on the trip, was a snake Indian. And she was grabbed by the Hidatsas, stolen in a raid. And her child lived to be a guide for German uh, uh, voyagers and German explorers. But her Chicago herself was not a guide as much as she was a, first of all, nobody fights a war with a woman in, with them. So she was a peace sign right off the bat for the, these guys going through the, the uh, wilderness. And most of the tribes accepted her. She also understood Shoshone, but also she had the connection for horses. And that's what they needed. And so it was kind of a manipulation. Lewis said, I need Chicago Leah because she knows Shoshone. And we need the horses to get over the pass. So, so that was one reason why they did. But a lot, of, and especially the Indians in Washington, the, the Walla Walla, they just loved them. They're great people, and they got along. The Ulipt was the, the the chief of the tribe over in the Yakima area, and they had a great time. The, the time here, the Northwest Coastal Indians, Chinook, the Tillamook, Clatsop, Salishan, uh, uh woodworkers, and of course they actually ended up stealing one of their canoes. So let's go. That's the take-home message. Uh, and this is what the Indian in, input. Uh, uh, there's one book, the, the sign talker, George Duyard, I want to say is a fabulous book. And it, this is the one man that the captain said they could not have done without. He fed them. He interpreted with the, to the other Indians uh, and tribes. She, he was, uh, and he got a lot of money, but he ended up dying early because he was in one of the forts up in uh Montana, so uh, uh, and, a, and a mixed breed we would call him. You know, that he born French and Indian, and there's a lot of French and Indians out there. But he was a French and Indian, a perfect guy, a, a great guy. Everybody said. And here's here's the other book, Sacagawea, which it reads backwards to you, but that is another book. And there's a lot of women in the group I know, and uh, I had a great mother, and this this book is a great book. It's a great read. Uh, I think I I, this, I had to trash the slide that had it in it. But anyway, so here we are. They take off. Lewis got the boat here in Pennsylvania and Pitts, Pittsburgh, came down with eight guys. Then they went all the way up to St. Louis. They had Camp Wood in St. Louis, right across the river, Alden, Illinois, if you happen to know that place. <laughs> but they went all the way to the Pacific, and then they came back. Lewis went a little bit different than Clark. Let's go to the next slide. So Elements of Botany was the first textbook written by Benjamin Smith Barton. He was supposed to be the botanist. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, next slide. And Barton, uh, they carried the book along with them all the way, but there were two pioneering botanists in, Calif in the, California, in the United States. These were both in Philadelphia, John Bartram and his son, William Bartram. They explored the east of the United States. He actually, had a, he has a great gardens there, Bartram Gardens. If you ever go to Philadelphia, it's one of the highlights of Philadelphia. He's got plants and he made trades with people in Europe. He, uh, and he actually had a name, named a plant after uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin. Let's go to the next slide. The first botanist in, Cal in the United States was John Bartram. How did he get back and forth? Well, I mentioned the horses. They needed the horses to get over the pass, but they had to go up the river. And they went up the Missouri River, which was very difficult. You can see there had poles. And in this uh, boat that was built, the keel boat was built in Pittsburgh. It was, the river was so low in uh, the fall when they went that they actually had to carry it and pull it by rope over some of the sandbars. Somebody had a question? No, okay. This is the boat they stole <laughs> from the Chinook Indians on the way back. Uh, they were short a canoe and so they uh, uh, gave them some trinkets and said, we're even and took off. And basically they ended up stealing the boat. 
these bull boats were used by the uh, uh, but one buffalo's hide and the willow branches. These were used to get across the river. The Mandans, their fort at Fort Mandan was across the river from where the Sioux were encamped. Or not the Sioux, excuse me, the Mandans and the Hadatsas were encamped, and so they had to use bull boats to do that. Lewis had no. What was that? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I can hear everybody, and if they're not muted, I. Uh, this is uh, the the iron boat, which caused a lot of consternation, and it didn't work because they didn't have pine pitch where they were. Uh, these are hollowed out canoes, which they used to go down the Clearwater River. After they got over the uh, Continental uh, Divide, they had to go down the uh, Clearwater River, the Locksha and the C Clearwater, actually mostly the Clearwater, the Locksha, where they, where they used horses. But so that's that's the way they got down. They had prorogues when they came back. They had prorogues when they went up. They stored these in caches in Missoula, Montana. Next slide. And the one tree that they counted on the most was- I can uh, hear him. I just can't hear him. The one tree that they had the problem with, or they, excuse me, the problem here- the one tree that they needed was the uh, cottonwoods for the canoes. And the canoe, the cottonwoods were the food for the beaver. And a lot of what drove Western expansion was the beaver because the trappers needed it. It was very fashionable. And this beaver skin sold for a lot of money. Let's go to the next slide. What kinds did they eat? At the Bandan villages, they ate the big three. And this is where they had... They traded for a lot of this stuff. The, the, their, uh, their blacksmith actually made weapons for the blacksmith for the uh, Indians and chain and trade for food. A little bit like a, you know selling uh, jet planes to the Saudis or something. But uh, uh, <laughs> the, you know maize, squash, and beans provides a pretty good diet. But they also were hunters, and most of these were hunter gatherers. But the Hadatsas and the Mandans actually had agricultural crops and actual agricultural villages. They grew peas and they actually gathered peas and beans from uh, underneath the stashes that some of the prairie uh, mice made. And the whole question about watermelons, we'll talk about that if, if we get there. Let's go to the next slide. What did they eat with the Indian guidance? Uh, Wapato, which is around in your area, Coos which is a, a turnip kind of like. This is licorice root. This is a Jerusalem Arctic choke, which is this plant here. Sarvis berries, the pawpaws, they ate most exclusively on their way home. They made 70 miles in one day down the Missouri and they all just stopped and ate pawpaws. They hardly sometimes didn't even prepare a meal. Let's go to the next slide. Here's, here's the berries, you know these berries, raspberries, uh, thimble berries, uh, 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 spectabilis, uh, uh, salmon berries, and uh, uh, vaccinium, various blueberries and huckleberries. These are ones that are on the north coast, and they ate some of these. At, uh, most of the crop was finished. They spent from November until uh, March at Fort Clatsop, and most of the berries had been eaten by the birds already. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so Camp Woods, St. Louis, Fort Bend, and uh, let's go to the next slide. Lewis collected uh, at only a few sites, and these are where they have materials. The stuff that he, this was sent back directly, and this is the only live plant material that is still exists to that we can trace Osage orange cuttings from uh, St. Louis, Missouri, uh, uh, Chouteau, who was a trader there, brought some from the Osage Indians who lived away a little, a little over this way. Uh, anyway, that was sent to, uh, that was a specific question somebody asked. That was sent back to uh, Philadelphia, and there are still plants in Philadelphia derived from this Osage orange. Now, uh, there were was one other plant that survived, that made it, and it's called Luisia Redeviva. Luisia has the name Rita Viva because Lewis collected non-flowering roots. He put it in the, uh, this uh, herbarium sheets 
And when it got back to Philadelphia, it was revived. But Mahan put it, uh, the guy who collected, uh, who was in charge of some of it, through, through uh, uh, Bart, Barton, he put it in some soil and it grew. So Luisa Rigaviva is the reviving plant. It grew actually two years after it had been sent there. A couple of collections up in uh, uh, Iowa and these collections. Now, all of these collections, eight through uh, two, made it back because the keel butt went back. But all of the stuff that they collected here was lost. It was lost because the Missouri River flooded. All of these collections in here were because, then you can see a lot of it here. This is the Fort Clapsop. And this is uh, along the Dells. And this is when they had to spend almost a month with the people in the Dez first because they uh, uh, couldn't get over the pass because there was too much snow. Let's go to the next slide. 250 tracheophyte species. These collected, uh, this is a lilium that had been known before, but they collected it in near Teddy Roosevelt National Park. Um, uh, 133 type specimens. That means it's the first plant of that group, of that species that has ever been collected and has been, it was described. Now, most of these plants weren't described until later by Persh, and he was a botanist, a German botanist. But many of the plants that were collected did not make it back. Let's go to the next slide. Maybe I should read my finger. Three species of abies were collected at Fort Clatsop, at Furs, but none of it shows up in the collection because it's hard to preserve a fir branch and a fir cone. Go to the next slide. Everybody's familiar with Acer Circe around the vine maple. These are plants. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And the big leaf maple, everybody knows that one. I love it. I wrote a paper on it when I was in college. Next slide. You see the name Persh there. That's because Persh described it. Acer macrophyllum, this is the same plant, but this is the specimen that they got, a leaf. Next slide. And there's the, most of the photographs in the presentation will be my photographs, unless uh, otherwise noted. And sometimes they are from the, the black and whites are photographs that uh, were from the uh, uh, Academy of Natural, National, Natural Science from the Lewis and Clark herbarium that's officially preserved there. Next slide, please. So everybody knows Yarrow. 1806 and May 20th, collected in Montana. That's when they were in May. Okay, next slide. We can go through these plant these plants fairly quickly because this is the largest alder. Everybody knows red alder. I know it from California, but you folks have it up there, and it's a very important uh, a tree that's used in furniture making nowadays. Next slide, please. Service berry or sarvis berry. I have a, a my college roommate was from Montana, and it's, it's sarvis berry. That's much of it. It's not sarvis berry. And that was eaten, and that was this was used in a lot of the pemmican. A lot of the Indians made pemmican, and they made, this was a, a winter storage food. Let's go to the next slide. And then an enemy canadensis, a beautiful plant I saw in North Dakota, South Dakota, gorgeous. A lot along the riverside. Let's let's keep going. In the Omaha town village. Everybody knows this is one of my favorite trees. I wrote a paper on this one too. Arbutus menziesii. Menzies was a uh, a doctor who was on the Vancouver expeditions and uh, when the Columbia River was named, and uh, that was preceded uh, Lewis and Clark by about ten years. And uh, Archibald Menzies collected a lot of plants and. Uh, uh, some of these made it back to England. A lot of the Lewis and Clark plants, uh, uh, you know, took years for them to get described. Let's go to the next one. Let's, let's do some of these pretty fast. 
Arc de Stavlis Uva Ursi, which is a ubiquitous uh, Arc de Stavlis that is low growing to the ground, loves the coast. He got it in Mandan, Florida, but it grows at point uh, deception there, whatever. Let's go to the next one. They used it for tobacco. They made tobacco out of it. Artemisia frigida. They did six species of Artemisia they collected. And this got sent back early. You can tell uh, when the keel bolt went back. But uh, these plants are very important as winter browse for a lot of animals because in the wintertime, the snow falls in the plains and this uh, stuff will grow in areas that are very poor soil in the rocky areas where the snow doesn't stay or the wind blows it away. So Ar Artemisia frigid is one of the most important uh, wildlife feeds out there and are all the Artemisias. Sage brushes might sound strange, but the animals, that's the only winter food. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, some of you know balsam root, uh, arrow leaf balsam root, a uh, couple of collection. Clickitat County, Washington, 14 April. This is just after they left and Lewis started collecting. So on the way home, Lewis is collecting and he is in charge of these plants and he knows they're not going to get lost. Let's go, to, let's go to the next slide. And this, uh, I ran this through Kelly a little earlier. Did anybody know Berberus aquifolium? Jude, you, you want to make it. a comment? Yeah. So Jude, what's the, well, you know what, what is it? You're on mute. Okay, Jude. Is he asking you. what state is this the state flower of? Yes. Oregon, Oregon. The, Oregon, Oregon, Oregon grape, yes. Berberus, <laughs> now uh, Kelly brought up that we know it as Mahonia, but you know, things change. DNA has changed lots of things, and they have done a lot of genetic, uh, you know, let's say, evaluation of many plant groups. And uh, we'll get to some, you know, I mean, I could spend a whole t day just, I attended a class on just one flower uh, about the, the name changes of not one group of flowers, the mimulus. Let's go to the next slide. Bletchlam spice camp. They collected six different or uh, seven, five different uh, ferns, but uh, this one is kind of unique in, in that the uh, spores come up on a fertile frond and the vegetated part are on these beautiful little fronds. Beautiful fern grows well in the redwoods areas. Let's go to the next one. Fort Clapsop, one of the few plants collected at Fort Clapsop. Now, this is, a, I should spend a little time here. Calicordus elegans. He collected the type specimen of Calicordus. Now, I'm from California. You have about four or five species of Calicordus up in Washington. California has over a hundred species. And this was the type specimen for that whole genus of plants. And he collected it in Kamii, Kamii uh, Idaho. And most of this collection will occur from early May to late May, almost the entire month of May, the ones that made it back in good condition, Lewis collected. And he saw to it that they were gonna make it all the way. He actually carried him up, up into almost Canada with him on, a, on horseback and then carried him back just because he didn't want him to get lost. Okay, and this, Calicordus means beautiful grass, beautiful plant. Persh described it. Persh is the one who does most of the descriptions. And he published a book called The Floor of North America. And he actually took 70 of the specimens from Lewis and Clark's collection and took them to England with it. But let's, we'll, we can move on now. Calypso bulbosa, anybody seen that? You can raise your hand, but that's a beautiful plant. And John Muir searched in the woods for days trying to find this plant up in Wisconsin at one time. Let's go to the next slide. This is a important food plant and it's at the Weite Prairie. And uh, they, when Lewis and Clark came over the pass, the Continental Divide, 
they had horses. Some of them had horses. Some of them didn't. They were walking. They were stumbling. They were starving. The uh, Indians gave them a lot of the com uh, tamasia to, to eat. They ate so many, they became flatulent. They couldn't even live in their, see in their tents with each other. And the, the, uh, the, this Weite Prairie is a very, very good place to go. You know, you're in Western Washington. I usually go into Eastern Washington because there's a lot more diversity in the plants for me. And uh, it's just an exciting place to be right where Lewis and Clark were. And there's this interpretive site and it's uh, it's very, very good. But this this plant was, was very, as a matter of fact, they became so sick after eating almost nothing, eating all of these bulbs and stuff, that they actually took a vote on whether they were gonna kill them and take their heart, the Indians did. And, one of the Indians who had been captive, but held captive by the uh, uh, Americans at one time before said, no, these are good people, do, you know, let them go. So, and of course, older women were very much the keepers of the morals and the truth and the, the, the whatever you want to call it, uh, the, the gusto, the, the get, gist of the societies. In the, these the Native American societies, and anyway, they were saved by uh, this this woman who said, "No, don't kill them." So let's let's go on to the next slide. That that's this, this is what one of these pictures I took. One of you know, a lot most of these, I, I took, but anyway, this is what Kamasia looks like. Uh, the uh, what do you guys call it, Kelly? Camus. 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 Okay. Next slide. Beautiful plant and edible. The one with white flowers near it is poisonous. Okay. Cenothus velatinus, pretty common. I've used that one for tobacco also. Um, clusters of white flowers. Uh, interesting. It fixes nitrogen with a, a fungal associate. You know, legumes are the most common plants that fix nitrogen, but uh, cenothus can do it too. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, self-explanatory slide in some ways. Clarkia pulchella, you don't have it where you live in uh, Washington, but it's common in Eastern Washington. This photograph was taken of seed I purchased from the Monticello Foundation. They sell the seed to Clarkia pulchella. I don't know, they, nobody knows exactly where the seed comes from for a lot, uh, much of the seed that was gathered by Lewis and Clark, and not, there wasn't too much. Mahan got a hold of and he kept no records. And so we don't know. So the live specimen, the only one was Osage Orange, and then the re Luisi Redivita regrew from the from the herbarium sheet. This one is sold by the uh, uh, foundation at Monticello where Jefferson lived, and this, and, and Lewisman, and this is a gorgeous plant, and you can buy it and plant it, and it grows well just about anywhere. This is from a plant that I grew in my backyard. Okay, so, uh, and this was spotted by uh, Clark, but Lewis took credit for it and everything. Clark just told him, hey, I spotted this plant, and Lewis went to the site and found it. So, uh, it was, and it's in this uh, Persia's book, Ragged Rogan. Any, any, anyway, I, I, it's not a classroom. I, I'm used to teaching in a classroom. I usually try to interact with the students, but let's go to the next slide. Claytonia siberica, Claytonia perfoliata, three species of Claytonia were seen. Uh, edible vegetation, you can eat it. And uh, this is some of the things that uh, 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 Chicago Wheel would have taught him. Lewis knew a lot of the edible plants back east, and especially if they were ribes or something that were simple. But the, this is a new genus here, so uh, I shouldn't say this. He wouldn't be a, a comfortable with it. Chicago Wheel could say, "Yes, we eat that plant." Let's go to the next one. 
Clematis hirsutissima. I I just happened to like this plant, and I saw it in a, by a friend, the Blue Mountains in Oregon. It's a, a, a quite a beautiful plant, and that's one of the plants that's in there. Uh, Camp Trumpetish and Camii. May 27th. Remember, May is the collection month for most of the Lewis and Clark collections. Let's go to the next slide. Somebody asked a question about bunchberry. Well, that's actually been changed now uh, to Cornus unalaskensis instead of Cornus canadensis. It used to be called Canada. But that's just from uh, some genetic stuff. And uh, gorgeous plant. I was up in Jasper. Not, uh, well, not Jasper. This was from uh, Whistler. And some of you may go to Whistler. And Whistler is just loaded with this stuff. Gorgeous. Uh, Gorgeous bunchberry. Let's go to the next slide. Cornus natalii, which is a tree. I don't know if anybody has it in their yard, but if you're blessed, if you do, because it's very difficult to grow. Most nurserymen don't sell it down here because it dies right off the bat. You can't give a guarantee. You have to have very good drainage, good soil conditions. And those aren't petals, of course. Those are bracts. The flowers are right in the middle. Let's go to the next slide. Cypripedium. I mean, I can't throw this plant out of this uh, gorgeous moccasin. Uh, uh, I don't know if anybody's ever seen it. I was in Colville, Washington, and there was a whole hillside that was covered with this orchid. Colville, Washington on the east side. Uh, beautiful. And uh, travelers, travelers rest. Let's go to the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. I just love it. Diaspora fruticosa. Some of you may know it as Pocatilla fruticosa. And this is the most widely distributed shrub in the Americas. It goes from Tierra del Fuego to Alaska. It's found in the mountains. I didn't take a picture of the shrub. I threw the picture of the shrub out because I didn't have it. But anyway, we're moving on. This is just a bee. Pollination is, you know, that's another sidetrack, but Pollinators are dying off all over the place, and we don't even know the reason why. A lot of people want to blame pesticides, but even way up where there are very little pesticides. Anyway, let's go to the next slide. Delphinium menziesii. I don't know if anybody knows Delphinium. We've seen it along the coast. This grows right on the coastal bluffs in California, Manchester Beach State Park. And I'm you can see from the distribution, these distributions are all from the USDA, and they have a great website that has the distributions of most of the cal of the native plants of America. And that's where I took this uh, uh, distribution data from these little maps. But I can see it grows in your area, and if, you know, right down on it's it grows right on the ocean almost in the coastal prairies. Let's let's go to the next one. Primula poetica or Jeffrey. I, I think the material is so screwed up they can't tell exactly which one it was. And you have to sometimes collect the leaves with it. But this is a primula is used to be called Dodecathion, but it's now primula. And they are gorgeous. And some everybody knows primula, primroses. You could plant the primroses in your garden. This is a spectacular plant, very nice. We have uh, uh, seven or eight species in California, and they grow, uh, you know, clay soils, and uh, they can grow right here in my house, house in Ca Concord, California. Let's go to the next slide. Erica Mary Nazi. I, sh I have to throw this in because there are a lot of Erica Marys. These are all a rabbit brush, and this is another uh, winter browse. Uh, uh, October 05, uh, Walla Walla County, Chrysosoma nausea. It, it uh, makes some people vomit from the odor and the uh, Persh uh, wrote, wrote up a lot of the stuff and his descriptions were from Clark's description and that's what he did. So we're getting lines all over here. What's going on? Next slide. Very common though. You can't go through. You can't go through the uh, Great Basin without going through that stuff. You are. Uh, this is the most uh, 
what the most common composite in uh, the West, and it's called Areophyllum, is the genus. Areophyllum linatum is one species of it, and there are so many different subspecies of it. It is a very variable plant, very common, very, it's called Oregon sunshine is a common name, but uh, it's a spectacular plant and it's all over Mount Diablo where I uh, happen to go all the time. And uh, here's another June 6th at Kamea, Idaho, Kamei, Idaho. Let's, next, next one, let's go. Everybody know, knows wallflower, right? This, I used to say this is what every girl didn't want to be called in high school, a wallflower. So anyway, <laughs> uh, what do we have? Uh, a purse's wallflower collected apparently at Kamaya Island. Sometimes the collection data is not that good. So let's go to the next slide. That, some of these plants we can go real fast. Erythronium grandiflorum avalanche lily. This is what they saw. This is a wonderful, collected twice, uh, May and June of uh, 06. Let's go to the next slide. Somebody wrote some stuff on their screen with their pen, and it's uh, irritating. If somebody can find out who's writing with their pen on the screen. Yeah, I'm not. I, I, it, it looks like somebody made some marks here. I'm trying to clear it up here, but but just Bob, yeah, sorry, I'll I have don't to continue. Think you yeah. can do it. <clears throat> okay, let's go to the next one. Euphorbia marginata and Euphorbia. They, they discovered both of those in the Great Plains. I mentioned this because this is the most commonly planted grass or used grass in uh, that Lewis and Clark collected. It's used in landscapes all over in California now because it's a uh, low alcohol. And I got a question, you know, what plants did they find that we use now? And this is one of them that's widely used in landscaping, master gardeners. But you don't have the problem with water that we have in California. Let's go to the next slide. Strawberry. Now, this is uh, a mountain strawberry, and uh, it's... Uh, can be uh, there's uh, four three uh, three or four species of strawberry in the United States, and uh, Chilowensis is the strawberry that was used for the hybridization for the commercial strawberry. But they found this strawberry and uh, seen and eaten, but apparently not collected. So they collect a sample. Who knows? It, let's let's face it. When you're these guys came back from. Astoria, Oregon, to St. Louis, Washington, in four months, five months, by boat, by horse. You don't have a lot of time sometimes. And also, I should mention, Lewis got shot through the buttocks, through the both cheeks of the buttocks, and was laid up for almost a month on the way back. Let's go to the next slide. So he didn't do a lot of collecting during that time. Frangula persiana, some of you might know that. It's a nice big tree, and it's also it's a, uh, the basis for a lot of laxatives. Let's go to the next slide. I don't know if anybody's ever seen Fraser of Fastigiata, just Fastigicata. Fastigiata, anyway. I've seen it a few times. I was very impressed, and that's one reason why it's in here. It's a it's a gorgeous plant, and I saw it up in Washington near Spokane. Next slide, please. Frizzlaria affinis, Schultes and Schultes were two California botanists who live up in Eureka. One of them just passed away, but it's still alive. But these are. Uh, a lot of these different uh, varieties of uh, fritillaria have been split. And we have what used to be called fritillaria lanceolata by Persh. And many of these bulbs, like the Camus bulbs, like the Calicortis bulbs, like uh, the fritillaria bulbs, were eaten by the natives. And that's important food to them because the, the Shoshones were not big if they went had to go 
to hunt buffalo, they had to go into the turf of other na Indians and natives, and they often ended up getting killed. So uh, let's go to the next. Uh, oh, I did want to mention one thing about that. Let's go to that last one. Let's go back to the last slide, the other slide. Yeah. Bryant Island or Bradford Island, Multnomah County. Apparently, the islands in the Columbia River were very rich with some of these plants and had not been destroyed. And so Sacagawea went in there sometimes and was digging up the wapato bulbs with her feet. That's how she dug them, with her with her feet. She would stand in the water and use her feet to dig up the wapato. And a, a lot of these other uh, uh, bulbs were more common on the islands because it, I guess it was more difficult for animals to get over there. So anyway, let's go to the next slide. So the, the important part of it was, uh, okay, Fritillaria pudica, another, this is a Fritillaria. If you don't know the liliaceous plants, Fritillaria is one. Eastern Washington, of course, but not where you you folks are. Let's go to the next one. Everybody knows Indian blanket, right? <laughs> collected by Lewis and Clark somewhere near Lewis and Clark Pass in Montana. So it's collected right in there. June 7, uh, 7 July 1806. Let's keep going. Great plant in the garden that grows well. Galtheria Salon, everybody knows Salal, right? A delicious berry. Uh, they thought it was a facsinium, but it's, a, it's been put in a different genus. And this is the specimen from the Lewis and Clark. Let's go to the next slide, please. These are some photos that I took. Let's go to the next slide. That's all Salal. Grindelia squarosa. Gumweeds. I threw this in. Uh, they spotted it. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a type uh, uh, specimen here, but most of the ones that I'm showing you are type specimens, unless I tell you. But uh, gumweed is very common in California and eastern Oregon. I'm not sure how common it is in eastern Washington, but you can see the distribution here as well into Montana and Washington. Okay, next slide. Friendly Indians meeting the snakes. Well, when Lewis and Clark reached the headwaters of the Missouri River, which was their goal, dictated by Jefferson, they made a decision to go over the pass. And remember, they had to meet the Shoshones in order to do that. They had come up in canoes, dugout canoes, and uh, canoes that were... Uh, unsatisfactory for any kind of portaging. They met the Shoshones. It was amazing. The chief of the Shoshones was Sacagawea's brother. You'd think they might get a good deal on the horses because they had to bargain for the horses. They didn't get a great deal, but at least they got horses and they made it into the Valley of the Bitterroot and they met some flatheads there and they got better horses. And then they came over the Lolo Pass. They went over the Continental Pass several times without knowing that they were creating problems by doing that. But anyway, they couldn't, they wanted to go down the Salmon River. Some of you know the Salmon River is the river of no return. They scouted it. The Indians told me, you can't do it. Clark went down, no, we can't do it. So they had to go back over the pass, Lola Pass, down into the Bitterroot Range. Then they came, oh, not Lola Pass, but uh, Chief Joseph Pass. And then they had to go over the, uh, the Continental Divide again between Idaho <clears throat> and Washington. Okay. Meeting the snakes. So that's the whole snakes thing. Uh, you can see the flag. A lot of them uh, uh, distrusted them. And all, I mean, there's so many interesting stories. If you haven't read the book uh, Undaunted Courage, 
it is, I, I must read. I showed you the Sacagawea book, but I, I, uh, Stephen Ambrose wrote uh, Undaunted Courage, and that's the, it's what got many people into the Lewis and Clark. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Cola disc cream bush, we don't have to talk about that much. Uh, some of you may know it. I know it well from the coast, California. Let's go to the next slide. Ipomosis aggregata, the collectives. A gorgeous plant uh, it was called Gilia aggregata by Persh, but uh, when it's maxim, that means a different botanist got a hold of it and reorganized re, uh, it, renamed it. The names are changed often in botany especially when we learn out the true origins. Next slide, please. We're gonna to have to go through some of these pretty fast. Uh, Missouri iris, uh, beautiful plants. Uh, they discovered uh, three species of iris. Let's go to the next one. Sometimes in the garden, irises are great in the garden. Three species of juniper. This is the one, only one that's a tree. So it's a dry side river. Uh, you know, dry side of the uh, continent, uh, I should say dry side of the continent, dry side of the Rockies. And uh, uh, juniper is used, you know, Virginia juniper is the old cedar chest that pe many people have. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, a hallmark plant here, Luricea Rita Viva. Persh named it in his book. Uh, Lewis wrote a much better description, but he wasn't a botany. He didn't get credit for that. Purse took Lewis's description and had material, and then he wrote this, about this one. I love this plant. It was a, a major part of the food that the Indians ate, the Shoshones especially, and uh, it's uh, just spectacular. Discovered New Missoula, Montana, uh, my college roommate was from Montana, and uh, his sister took me up to a place where they had discovered a lot of the uh, Montana uh, bitter roots and where they had collected them when he was a kid. Next slide, please. It's on Mount Diablo, where I live. Next slide, please. Okay, and it's also a Montana state flower. Now, George Girard, who I meant, Drewer, who I mentioned was the, the uh, sign talker, he captured a bag of these roots when some Indians that kind of challenged him and he ended up stealing back. They tried to steal his rifle and he took back the rifle and then he uh, had the gun and they, they took off running and he ended up bringing back a whole gunny sack full of this stuff, which was worth at least a wife in those days, uh, and uh, Lewis ate them and he said he didn't like them. Apparently you have to boil them a certain way. Next slide, please. Montana state flower, you know that. Lilium philadelphia, we know uh, the, the widespread, uh, beautiful plant, but not found in Washington, Oregon, or let's go to the next one. Found in uh, plants that are useful, Linum Louisii, this is a whole group. Some of you may use linseed oil. Linum is the plant that produces the seeds. There's this little seed pod right over there almost. So let's go to the next side, Beaverhead County, Montana. Lomation Coos, Coos biscuit root. This is a turnip, more or less. It's in the parsley family, the turnip family, the carrot family. It has a large underground root. You see this plant, they dig it out and they eat this and they make bread out of it. They use it uh, halted early and partook of a sumptuous dinner of a fat saddle of venison and a mush of coos, cows, I should say. It's cows. It's pronounced cows. And this is in the Lewis and Clark collection. Next specimen, next slide, please. Linicerus uh, ciliosa and invoculata. These I'm very familiar with. It. I photographed this one, I remember, in uh, Montana. And uh, great plants, beautiful. This one grows along the coast. This one happens to grow generally on the interiors. 
<laughs> if you're getting bored, let me know. Well, Bob, I think I think this probably is a good time to think about checking in. It's been it's, it's been a solid, you know, this this t- tremendous amount of uh, plants and things that you share here indeed are phenomenal. Well, the key question I want to emphasize: the path. The, let's 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 go quick, 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 okay. quick, right? Because there's a couple of slides right at the blast I want to do. Yeah. Okay, Lupinus. We get Lupinus. They found just just do just do boom boom boom. This is the fruit that from the tree that was sent back to to. Uh, which call it to uh, Washington D.C. and to uh, Philadelphia. Next one, real quick. Erythronium. It's not mimulus anymore. It's erythronium. To it as fast as you can. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Fast as you can. Okay. <laughs> tobacco. That they, they collected the tobacco. It grows only native in these areas, but Indians had traded and they had collected it in South Dakota because the Indian trade had taken this plant, which is native only in these areas, to South Dakota. Next one, keep going. This is what caused a great amount of pain. They had wa- ma- only moccasins on. Let's keep going. They had much pain. They had, they had to do portages. Uh, Orthocarpus, let's, keep go- let's go. All the owl clovers. A pedicularis, a gorgeous plant, uh, collected near Kamii. Kamii is where most, let's just, just, just hit them. Penstem and fruticosis, most of you know those, you know that. These are all plants by, written up by Philadelphus Louisii, Louisii. That's a gorgeous plant, great plant to have in here. It's the state flower of Idaho. Let's go. Next slide. Steinbach, another beautiful plant, good landscaping. I planted, I do some landscaping up at our timeshare. I planted this up there for landscaping. Pinus, uh, what's a good one? Yeah, go, go to the next one. Huh? Pinus ponderosa, the most important timber tree in most of the West, except in Oregon and Washington, where you've got uh, lots of other stuff. But in, in many, many states, this is the number one tree harvested for timber. Let's go. Palmonium, beautiful plant. Uh, I have intimate relations with a lot of these plants. Let's go to the next slide, please. This, Prunus virginiana, they ate a lot of this stuff. They ate the berries of Prunus uh, virginiana, which is the, a choke cherry. And we'll keep going. State tree of Oregon. What's what's Washington State tree? I think we have the hemlock, isn't it? Yes, Western hemlock, mountain hemlock, Western hemlock. Okay, uh, let's keep going. Persia tridentata. Persia. What can you say about it? this? Is the genus named for a bush that's all over in the Great Basin area? Let's keep going. Fort Clatsop. up. You all know they spent time there at Fort Clatsop, just south of Astoria. Mm-hmm. Kelly, you didn't go to the meeting there, but they had a meeting in Astoria, and it was, it was great. Lewis and Clark Trail Heritage Foundation, I want to put in, fabulous organization. You would you would second that, right, Kelly? Well, very much so. In fact, this probably is a good time just to check in, that's for sure, because this this has been, this is the, uh, by the way, has, has, has everyone been down to Fort Clatsop, you know, in Astoria? I would hope that uh, folks have been, because uh, they've, they've recently, by the way, they of course redid the fort, but they've just redone the entryway and the and the visitor center. So that has just been opened. That that construction was just completed in the last few months. So it, um, if you if you're down doing your tax free shopping, uh, and of course it uh, you know that that's as the it, um, this is casual cross border tax evasion as the Washington Department of Revenue refers to it. But if you're casually evading our taxes, right, by going to Astoria, spend some time over at the at, uh, at Fort Class if you really enjoy it. But Bob, the key, the key thing I wanted to get to here is that so many of these plants, it strikes me that because they were collecting so many of these plants on their way home in the spring, that this is yeah. where they were able to find so many uh, plants that were blooming. I'm, yeah. I'm 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 struck by the fact that the timing of their visits, you know, 
uh, would have uh, impacted dramatically the types of plants that they were aware of or collecting. Oh, um, certainly. So that, certainly, of course, yeah. is a is a key point. The other point, of course, is that uh, what strikes me is that uh, how much information they gleaned from the natives, the Native Americans, right? You know, is that uh, as they were going through this process. Vocabularies of virtually every tribe that they spent any time with. A million words in the journals. But it sounds like words. all the names that have survived, you know, even the common names have often been um, anglicized, right? You know, is it uh, so? Oh, sure. It, yeah. So, so very little of the native dialect, you know, has been preserved, right? You know, when we start talking about the the berries, the the, the oh, plants. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's a big point, and I don't, I. You and I, and probably only everybody in the, you have to side with the Native Americans when it comes to people who got the shaft. I mean, they had some serious, thank you for doing that. That's important. Okay, that, 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 okay that's good. So you have to side with the Native American. I am, a, did they get the shaft? Did they get the raw end of the deal? You know, it's a, uh Bill Cosby used to, you know, okay, flip the coin. Okay, I get all the land and all the food and all the water. You get uh, some desert land over here, and maybe we'll take it away from you later. Uh, I mean, it, that kind of situation. Now, uh, Alaska Natives did a little bit better because they had the that Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act. But uh, most of the North American Indians didn't fare very well. They have made up a little bit of it with the gambling. So let's let's begin here. Lewis and Clark Herbarium, the, the, the Nat Academy of Natural Sciences in Fidelity, Philadelphia. One more slide, next slide, and next slide, and I think that's it. Uh, James Reveal is the botanist of the Lewis and Clark. He did a, a thing, and there's a C.D. Rom. You can get the next one. Gary Moultone wrote wrote the the uh, uh, Definitive Lewis and Clark journals, fabulous job. Next one, and that's I think that's it. Yeah. Yep. There you go. And there's the ultimate Lewis and Clark plant, Clarkia Louisii, found only in California. <laughs> we have I think 40, 44 or so of the forty-eight existent species of Clarkia in California. One species in Chile. How it got there? I don't know if you've ever, anybody grow Clarkia? The seeds are so small, they could get stuck in a bird's foot or a bird's feather or something. Anyway, Clarkia is one species that's down in Chile. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I know that. Uh, it's just so much stuff, and I get so uh, wrapped up in it. And I uh, had a minor emergency this morning when my neighbor came over and ha had some printing for me to do right when I was supposed to be. But anyway, to make a long story short, I appreciate eager crowds. And the one thing I want to leave everybody with is some enthusiasm, because this is one of the most exciting things. I'm 78 years old, and this is one of the most exciting things that ever happened in my life, reading the book on uh, Undaunted Courage and uh, uh, Stephen Ambrose book. And, uh, it, you know, it's just, it just, it makes your life very full when you have something to pursue as well, you age. Well, and I, I thought you were going to say that uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition happened during your life, but I'm, I'm certainly glad you corrected yourself and mentioned the fact that you were just, you know, just studying well, up on Lewis and Clark. Yeah. <laughs> I Obviously, there's the, Lewis and Clark. the, the reason... Bob, one of the reasons we're very excited to have you here, obviously, is it because Lewis and Clark's, you know, spent so much time out here in the Northwest, you know, and oh, the, yeah. the, the plant, the plant, plant material that you've, you've, you've just touched upon in your presentation here is so significant, you know, it deserves in our, in our mission as master gardeners outreaching with the public, right? I think it's, it's imperative to pass on some of that history. The fact that uh, so many of these common plants, right, have become known to us, you know, through the expedition. So it was a it's from a botanical standpoint, the expl the explorations and the documentation and the samples that they brought back were incredibly significant, right? To the to the to some of the most common, you know, plants that we have here. 
So it's a, and by the way, what's coming through in chat, obviously, Bob, is, you know, great pictures, by the way. So you've actually, at, uh, you know, the at, uh, as I mentioned to you before, the 500 megabyte presentation that you just saw, you know, in PowerPoint is deserving of the incredible pixelated content of the, uh, of the presentation. Are there some questions for Bob, some particular questions and thoughts you guys want to share quickly? I'm free the whole time, so... <laughs> I'm free until 145. That's <laughs> okay. <laughs> questions uh, for any questions for Bob. I know some people had asked questions about uh, well, uh, I, bunchberry was one of them, but there was one other plant that, that, that Lewis and Clark never touched, smelled, or and I'm trying to think about it. I, anyway, I, I'm an old man. I just I, I can't bring it up. Uh, <laughs> easily in my mind uh, that uh, the ram goes before the hard disks you know <laughs> yeah well bob i want to thank you so very much for being with us here today and i want to thank everybody who's joining us here you know for this uh, presentation here today there's so much to learn and again i want to a shout out to uh, to not only to bob but also for the lewis and clark trail heritage foundation there's a tremendous amount to learn and a tremendous amount of botanical knowledge to learn through the exploits of the of all this yeah. um a quick reminder by the way is that uh, our board meeting is tonight at 6 p.m our board will meet tonight at 6 p.m via that separate zoom link you know that's also available in the e-news if there's any everyone's welcome to join us here uh and of course it, um let's that uh, uh as, as we as we've been talking about early in the presentation july 22nd is coming up our very important uh you know a very important uh, uh date here for the garden tour and for the, again, hundreds of individuals that we will welcome to these various gardens throughout the day. Any other comments for the good of the order? Any other comments from anyone for the good of the order today? Kelly, I will say I will give out my email address to anybody that you think might be interested in responding to me. Bob Case at astound.net. And of course you have it because you've got, because we've been emailing each other back and forth. but. I uh, have nothing better to do. I flatlined three <laughs> years ago, and I have nothing better to do than to try to. Our master gardener leader told me, said, Bob, you need to get this out to everybody. I teach classes for our master gardeners here in California, the UC extension. And uh, she said, get it out, let it out. <laughs> so uh, I, that's exactly what I do. I want anybody who is interested in uh finding out about lewis and clark plants that's what that's one of my specialties i do invasive plants and a few other things too but lewis and clark plants are and i'm looking at jude and jude do you have anything to say ask me a question please you even have the mic you're on the spot jude I, no. I, I'm, I'm going to say, I want to communicate with you, please, if I could, Bob. You've oh, given sure. a lot of ideas. Uh, we have a native plant garden in our demonstration garden in Elma, and I've just got to add some of these plants to it because we do do a Lewis and Clark kind of identification for kids as an activity at the fairgrounds. So big, beautiful things that I hadn't even thought of before. Thank you. Oh, well, you're more than welcome. I, Like I said, I've got nothing better to do than to meet with folks like you. Well, this is better than almost anything that anybody could do. So great. Thank you. <laughs> Hey, with that again, I want to let's let's free up everybody here for the afternoon. I want to thank everybody for their uh, their joining us here today and for their participation and for all that you do, uh, because it uh, certainly is that as we get as we're into this big summer cycle here of a garden tour of plant clinics of workshops and work groups and so forth, we're reaching a lot of people and we're impacting a lot of people's lives with respect to gardening and respect to their outreach. And it, uh, so again, it's important work what we all do as volunteers. So celebrate that. And it, uh, let's get cranked up for the garden tour. Okay. Amen. Thank you all. Take good care. Bye-bye. Okay.